Hi everybody, it's me, R. Dallas. In this video, I'm going to share with you my five rules for writing better DTOs in your software. So, let's start with what is a DTO? A DTO is a data transfer object. That's what the acronym stands for, and that is essentially what defines such an object. DTOs are meant to be used to transfer data, which often means they are easily serialized to and from other formats like JSON or XML. This also means that when the destination of the transfer receives the data, it should be free to do so using whatever type it wants, even a dynamic type, so long as it can hold the values. And that means DTOs should not have any behavior, because you cannot expect the receiver of your data to deserialize the data into a type that has the same behavior as the thing that you serialized when you sent it. Only the data values are going to transfer. So the first rule of DTOs is DTOs should not have any logic or behavior. If they do, then they're not a DTO. Now, before we get into the next rules, I want to let you know about a course I published recently on modular monoliths. I really think this is the approach you should be using for most non-trivial .NET applications. I've published it with Nick Chapsis' Dome Train site, and he does an amazing job of recommending it. So let me turn it over to him for just a moment. Now, before I move on, I'd like to let you know that we just launched a brand new course on Dome Train called Deep Dive into Modular Monoliths. And it's a direct sequel from the Getting Started delivered a few weeks ago by our Dallas or Steve Smith. Steve did an amazing job with that first course and you loved it. So we had to get out the Deep Dive one as fast as possible just to see how the whole application is completing and being ready to go to production with more features and more modules to have a complete modular monolith, which in case you don't know, I think it's the Goldilocks zone between microservices and old bad monoliths. It's where most people, and by most, I mean almost everyone should start before they feel like they have to go anywhere else, maybe microservices or maybe even further. Both the deep dive and the getting started should be taken by every .NET developer working in modern .NET. There's so many best practices you're going to learn there. And to celebrate the launch of the deep dive, you can use code modular20 at checkout or use the link in the description to claim 20% off that course. And you can also add the Getting Started course in your basket for a massive discount if you don't have that already. And on top of that, we also have a From Zero to Hero Modular Models bundle now, which allows you to combine both courses with a 20% discount. Okay, now back to the video. Okay, now let's jump into some code. All right, in this simple application, I'm going to show you a few examples of DTOs using different types in C Sharp. Let's start with a simple person DTO. We can create a DTO by just using a record type and have a very succinct way of defining them. And then we can use that DTO inside of our code like this. And of course, if we run this, you can see that one of the nice features of record types is that we automatically see all the properties and their values without having to override toString or anything like that. All right, now one trick with this is that we can't do person dot last name equals Smith, that's going to fail because we don't have a public setter on last name. All of the fields that we specify on the constructor of a record type are in it only. Okay, but what about serialization? That's the main thing we want to use these types for. Well, we can take our person and we can serialize it into some JSON and then round trip that by deserializing it back and see what we get. So I'm going to go ahead and use system.text.json's JSON serializer here, and we're going to serialize the person into a string. We're going to write out that string, and then we're going to deserialize it into a new variable and print that out. And you can see here that we get the same values all the way around. We started out with person DTO, John Doe, and that's what we have when we're done. So this is working as you would expect. Now there may be some reasons why you don't want to use a record type and you'd prefer to use a class. So let's see what that would look like. In this case, we're going to use a customer DTO just so we have a different name for the type. And you can see that we can set it up with init only properties also. So when we work with this, it's going to work pretty much the same way. We can create the customer. We can print out the customer. However, in this case, you can see that all we get is customer DTO when we print it because classes don't have an automatic implementation of toString that shows all of their properties. Once again, if we try and set an init-only property, we're going to get the same error 
saying that we can't do so. But with the class, we can easily change this to allow setting. And at that point, this should start to work. If we want to be able to print this out easily, we have to override toString. Now, what this init only behavior is doing is ensuring that these instances are immutable, right? So when we create one of these, whether we deserialized it from something or we created it ourselves, we're not gonna be able to change it. Now, immutability can be a valuable feature of these objects to have, especially if we are deserializing something. We can work with that type within a context, within a method body, for instance, and know for the life of that method that we are working with the thing that was passed in, the message that we received, the thing that we deserialized. There's no way for you to change it because it's immutable. However, when you're going to create a message that you want to send, sometimes you don't know all the data up front and it can be burdensome to have to create a bunch of local variables to, to pull everything in and then finally create the DTO. So sometimes when you're creating these DTOs yourself, it's much more convenient to have public setters on your class that make it easier for you to just set the items as you get them rather than having to create it all at once. So immutability can be a nice feature. It's not a rule for DTOs. Your DTOs could be immutable or they might not be. Do what makes sense in your context. All right, so what about encapsulation? In object-oriented programming, one of the key values of how we build objects is that we encapsulate by hiding information from outside collaborators. So when you create, for instance, an entity, we are able to make it so that the logic of how certain operations are performed within that entity are hidden from the user. We're also able to encapsulate the state so that the only way you can mutate the state of an entity is by going through certain uh, well-known public interfaces or methods and not by allowing anyone to just manipulate the state anytime they want. So these are all good things for objects like entities, but for data transfer objects, there shouldn't really be any encapsulation. What that means is that your DTOs typically aren't going to have any private or protected members. Everything in the DTO should be public, and in many cases, it should be mutable, as we already discussed with the immutability concern. And so that's rule number two for your DTOs. Your DTOs should not enforce encapsulation. They're not going to need private or protected members inside of them. Now, once you tell developers that DTOs don't need any encapsulation, a very common next question is going to be, well, in that case, do we need to use properties? Can we just use fields for everything since we're not trying to encapsulate the members or the state of this object? And the reason why we prefer to use properties mostly has to do with the fact that properties have first class support in C Sharp for a variety of things and fields often don't have any support or that support is much later in coming. So for example, let's create another DTO. We'll call it order DTO and we'll just use public fields for the different values that it has, the ID, the order number, and the total. We can create an order like this one and we can print it out just like we've seen it already. Because it's a class, it's just gonna print out the type name. Now let's try and serialize it just like we did previously. And here you can see that the serialized order that only had fields ends up giving us just an empty set of curly braces for the JSON. So serialization doesn't work on fields. It does work on properties. That brings us to my third rule for DTOs, which is that DTOs should use properties and never fields. If you are using fields, you're likely to run into problems when you try and serialize or deserialize these types. So that brings us to the next question that's very frequent with these types is, what should we name them? Now you've seen me use the suffix DTO so far, and that's a pretty common thing to use for individual records that we're talking about. Uh, whether it's you know a, a person or a customer or an order, often those are going to just be called DTO to indicate that that's what that purpose is. You might choose to use DTO or uh, if you prefer, you might use DTO with just a capital D. Either one of those is fine. However, what you want to avoid is using that suffix too much for things that happen to be DTOs, but have a more specific purpose. So what I'm talking about here are things like uh, view models or request types or response types, which are DTOs, but you don't want to just call it a DTO. And if you know that it's a view model, 
and you know that view models are DTOs, then it's redundant to say it's a view model DTO. So you can use a view model or request or response as the suffix and don't use view model DTO, request DTO, etc. So that brings me to my fourth rule on DTOs, which is that they should only use DTO as the suffix of their name as a last resort. Otherwise, you should name them for how they are used. If you're building an API, I strongly encourage you to look at the Reaper design pattern, which I covered in a recent video. Now, if you're using this approach, when you go to create a record, for instance, a person, you may have a person DTO, but when you go to create that thing, it's usually better if you have a custom DTO just for that creation. So for example, you might have an endpoint that takes in a create person request, and yeah, it happens to have a first name and a last name, just like person DTO does. But it's much more clear that this is the type that we're going to expect for this endpoint's request. And it may be that we'll have additional things that will need to be added, or things that we won't need when we create a person, but later on will be added. So for example, maybe a person DTO also at some point will have a created date as a property. Well, the create person request is not going to include that because we don't want the end client code to send us that create date. We want that to be something we generate when we successfully create the person. And so there's often going to be some disparity between the message formats that you use for requests and responses, for commands and queries and events, even though they might look very similar to your DTO that represents a concept in the system, we want to have discrete separate types for those, which are themselves DTOs, but which have a specific purpose and a specific suffix name they use for that purpose. So that brings me to rule number five. These types of things should all be modeled as DTOs, API request and response objects, MVC view model objects, database query result objects, and messages like commands, events, and queries. And because they're going to be modeled as DTOs, and since everybody knows that they're DTOs, you don't need to put DTO in their name. Those should just be suffixed with request or view model or, you know, query result or something like that. Now, since we're talking about view models, let me point out that I'm specifically referring to MVC style view models. If you're building something using WPF and the MVVM approach, those view models often do have behavior and should not be DTOs. So if we look at a Venn diagram describing DTOs, MVC view models, and MVVM view models, it's going to look something like this, where all MVC view models should typically be DTOs and MVVM view models typically should not. Let's look at some examples of DTOs following rule number five. Here you can see, you can imagine that there might be an API that takes in a create user request. Inside of that API endpoint, it might create a create user command. That create user command might be dispatched to a handler. Within that handler, it may need to check whether or not that user already exists. And so it may issue a query using a user exists query DTO. And then once it knows that that user doesn't exist, it can successfully create that user triggering a user created event DTO. Now, once that's done, it can return back a create user response to the consumer of the API. And then if necessary, it might also have a user details view model that would be used to display inside of a view or a razor page, the details of a user. All right, that's it for the five rules. Now I wanna cover one last thing, which is what about validation and attributes? You might add attributes to say that particular properties are required or have to have a certain format, and then you can leverage some of the built-in validation features of ASP.NET or other libraries in order to use that validation without having to write that validation yourself. For example, we can create a record, create user request with attributes that says it has an email and a password. The email is decorated with an attribute that says it's an email address, and the password has a minimum length of eight. These are attributes that are coming from the system.componentmodel.data annotations namespace. And of course, we can do the same thing with a class. So here's the exact same type, but this time with a class instead of a record. Now, how do you actually perform this validation? 
Well, you can use the built-in functionality of MVC or similar types, or you can do it yourself in code. So for this example, I'm creating a create user request with attributes. It has an email address of john.doe.com, which is not a valid email, and it has a password of 123, which is not a minimum length of eight. So to perform the validation, we create a list that we're going to get the validation results in. We call this is valid uh, by calling try validate object on validator. Validator is a system that component model data annotations type. And when it's done, we're going to get back this is valid as a Boolean, as well as the validation results. So we can validate this request and say, is it valid? We're expecting it to not be valid. And you can see right here, the request is valid. So what's going on here? The issue is described in this GitHub issue where validator that try validate object does not handle record types. I don't know why this issue has been around for a couple of years now, but as of .NET 8, as of April of 2024, when I'm recording this, this still is not handled. What if we do the same thing with our class version? We've got the create user request with attributes class type, same inputs, all the same logic. We're gonna see is the class request valid. And here you can see that it is not. And it, we see the email field is not a valid email address. The password field must be a string or array type with a minimum length of eight. So it works as we expect. Personally, I favor using Fluent Validation, which is a very popular uh, NuGet package that you could use for your validation. If we use Fluent Validation, this becomes something that works for both records and classes. So let's see what that would look like. With Fluent Validation, you have to create your own class for each validator. And so here I've created a validator for create request with attributes. That's the record. And it inherits from abstract validator of T, where T is that record type. And in here, I'm gonna set up a couple of rules, one rule for email, one rule for password. Then to run this, we're just gonna create an instance of that validator and call its validate method. Assuming that it's not valid, we can cycle through the validation result errors and see what those errors are. Down here at the bottom, we see the fluent validation section. And of course you see email is not valid and the password must be at least eight characters long. That's on the record type. The class type works exactly the same way and you would write the same validator for that. I hope you found this helpful. Feel free to share these rules with your coworkers. Share this video with anyone you think would benefit from it. If you want the source code, there's a link in the description where you can request it and then you can play with the sample and, and see how everything works yourself as well. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments. If you have any requests for new videos, let me know about those in the comments as well. Until then, keep improving.